Hello everyone. Today with us we have Natasha Bouchelon, who is the founder of Canvas ABA Art, the pioneering behavior analytic art curriculum designed to foster creative relations and achieve socially important goals for neurodiverse children. She extends her expertise through Emergent Learning Academy, where she offers virtual training, coaching, and certification for clinicians. As a subject matter expert in relational frame theory, PFA, SBT, uh, assessment-based ABA, course design, acceptance and commitment therapy, staff development, and clinician training. Natasha's breadth of knowledge is vast and impactful. Her passion for utilizing user experience research and behavior analysis is evident in her commitment to creating positive change in the world. We are so excited to have you here with us today, Natasha. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Um, so let's start, like, just tell us, I know I gave like your, your bio and all of like you like have so many amazing things, um, experiences that you bring to us today, but uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so prior to ABA, I had a long time career as a fine artist. I launched my art career sometime when my youngest boy was about to turn two years old. So I have two older boys right now, they're 20 and 21. And um, I started the art business mostly out of hope that it would be something that I could um, be able to stay home with them. My younger boy had just been diagnosed with autism and we were struggling to like figure out things that we could do for him. Cause at the time we didn't have any knowledge of ABA or any kind of interventions or therapies that could be done. Um, I was, you know, that desperate parent that was trying to find solutions, but it just made more sense for me to be at home, though I was really young at the time, and I was starting to go to um, university for graphic design. Um, the the art took off. I became very active in the online community, selling my work online, and eventually was doing other things where I, I got involved in the tech space because I was kind of an early adopter. Um, with social media. I was blogging and video blogging before YouTube existed. It was back when we had to upload videos to archive.org and then post it onto our blog. Like extensive processes that there were just to be a part of this like different thing. Um, then that, that knowledge kind of helped propel me to go into this, this other um, industry where I was teaching entrepreneurs in general how to utilize the web to um, navigate building an online business and launching. Um, straightforward to like 2013, 2014, I'm going back to school thinking I'm going to become an art educator. I'm like, let's add this to my cache of things I'm doing as an art um, artist. And my boys are much older at the time. Um, and I had that psych 101 class where I've learned that you actually get to work with kids on the autism spectrum. I had a professor who talked about working with them and I was like absolutely intrigued. One, because I still didn't know anything about ABA. I hadn't heard anything about it. My kids were doing fine. And, and I know my younger boy actually had a form of ABA in kindergarten, um, experimental at the time. And I, I immediately did my research, got my first BT job and in a local center and fell in love with the science, fell in love with ABA immediately pivoted towards a degree in psychology. So I finished my undergrad at University of Michigan in applied psychology um, with a capstone in evolutionary psychology. I was really in, in, intrigued by that area. Um, and then later on moved towards my master's in psychology and behavior analysis. I became a BCBA in 2019. Um, and I've been in a variety of different um, environments and clinics, so smaller boutique clinics, um, larger corporations, and then later on did some work for Centria, kind of like they were able to, they created this role for me where I was um, marrying the two worlds of my creative, my creative production, content production and marketing with my experience of behavior analysis. And of course, my passion for SBT and PFA, because they were spearheading this program where they were shifting towards more compassionate care. Um, and so I've done a variety of things and I've been really passionate about the areas of RFT and ACT. So I was able to have the privilege of doing some work with Dr. Mark Dixon. Um, and he helped kind of pave the path for me to publish the first book in Canvas. And so here I am. <laughs> I don't know if that was too much information, but 
No, that's just, that's perfect. It helps us to understand who you are and why you chose what you, what you chose. Um, well, so tell, tell us more about the, like how you're marrying ABA and art. What does that look like? Yeah, sure. So um, it's, it seems like a really perfect tool for the area of RFT. I think that a lot of what we do in derived relational responding and building those emergent relations are very easily um, approached in the art process. And being an artist coming from a background where I used it as a form of communication, I use it as a form of all kinds of like self-regulation and um, presenting a message. It just made, it seemed like the right fit. And so I did a lot of my research in grad school trying to navigate whether this was already being approached in our field, which I was stunned that there really wasn't a whole lot. There was some research by um, Dr. Francis Mechner on the concept and kind of like a proposal he had made on us actually approaching this from both the analysis of experiencing art as well as the analysis of producing art. And I have been nonstop trying to figure out how we could marry the two. It just, it, it's utilized like in Canvas, it's utilized as a tool, not necessarily an approach, art therapy approach. That's a whole other area and, and outside of our scope. But in Canvas, we utilize it as a tool to um, build our skills in RFT and, and so forth. Yeah. What would, uh, like, what, uh, what individuals benefit the most from it? Um, is this something that you could apply in, you know, any program for any individual on the spectrum who, like, is also getting ABA? Or is there a specific, like, subset of individuals that it, you know, is better for? That's a good question. I, honestly, I produced it with the idea in mind that could be utilized with any any child of any ability, any age. Um, the book itself, I, I created it in mind with the idea you could use it with kids that are at least, at least three and up. Um, I think that the kids that will benefit the most from it are the ones who already have that demonstration that they do find art reinforcing because that's going to be an important part of that. Like there's a lot of materials and media you're working with that might be aversive in some condition, some level. Um, but again, I do have a lot of guidelines and help on, on how to navigate that area. Um, with that said, I think older learners, adolescents will probably utilize it the best. I do have it programmed in such a way that they're targeting um, things based on their level. So all around, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell us more about your book. Yeah. So Canvas is a curriculum that I developed to be able to target two things. So one, we're trying to um, build functional skills. It has its own program, um, curriculum program in it. It has an assessment process, and it also is able to be applied to kids based on what level they might be at. So you're targeting where they are in terms of their drive relational responding. Can they make drive relations um, and what level they, they're at at that? And then the art lessons, there's two types of art lessons that are going on in there. You have what's called the flow lessons, which is kind of like an everyday exercise and building those derived relations is all, and also psychological flexibility, um, which again is another awesome thing about art as a tool for that. Um, there's so many natural opportunities to make contact with challenging situ situations or difficult materials or just creating art in general um, so you have the flow lessons, the flow sessions that you can, um, apply on a daily basis. And then you have the larger, what we call the expand lessons, where you're getting into a variety of materials, you're working on larger projects, it could be something that you're doing as a group. Um, and there's about 200, 200 art lessons in the book. Wow, that's that's expansive. <laughs> that's a lot. That's great. Um, all right, so let's say uh, 
child, like a school age, like elementary child, was having difficulty with trying things that are hard. You know, like, like trying a new skill and it's really hard and they're expecting to be able to do it just the right way, right away, right? And so they're having trouble with being hard. Um, you know, there may be a bit like of transition issue in there too, you know, what, like, how would you approach something like that? I know this is like very general and like to really come up with a plan. I know you would have to know a lot more and do the assessment and all of that, but just in general, like just to kind of paint a picture for us of like what it might look like to incorporate this within working on a skill like that. Yeah, sure. There's definitely, yeah, for um, a child is making, meeting those challenges, I think that it's a perfect tool and that the, the flow lessons themselves will help them work on that flexibility. Um, and there's actually some programs and art lessons that help them work through that challenge. Those kind of more act based, those ones that you get into um, where they can go through and not not necessarily contrive that challenge. It's going to happen anyway in the, in the session. They're going to have some problems with the materials or the art's not going to come out right. Um, but the, the program itself shows the clinician how they can um, tack that scenario. What's happening here? What challenges are you facing? Um, that child gets to have that ability, that opportunity to practice that in the art lessons. Um, those are actually in there specifically for those particular challenges. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a matter of finding the specific art program. Um, and then again, utilizing the flow sessions that are in the program, actually like a, like a daily practice building that skill. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes so much sense because within art, even on a basic level, I'm by no means an artist, but I enjoy art and um, I enjoy creating and, you know, arts and crafts projects and here's the canvas, here's some paint, let's see what happens, right? And so, you know, throughout my career working with kids, mostly in early intervention and early um, elementary school age, um, I really enjoyed bringing out activities as like part of like um, the natural environment and you know, contriving situations and through play and like using art because so many things naturally occur during that like oh maybe you don't like the feel of the paint or maybe you don't like it when you make a mistake or you know I so many things and so um when I heard um you know about you and this curriculum and it just I was like that's such a perfect idea I mean it's just because you know with wanting to contrive situations to help, you know, offer lots of chance for practice, but doing so in such a natural environment where you're not like doing table time drills and, you know, it's meaningful and, you know, um, yeah, I just really love this idea. I would really love to be able to observe a session or learn more about it uh, one day, um, just because it's so interesting. Um, what? I have a question. You have a question. <clears throat> yeah. So if I got the book and it had the 200, I'm not a BCBA, but let's say I was, <laughs> and I got the book, would I be, after reading the book, am I competent enough to take this on my own? Or do you a recommend a course? Or is this something that you kind of do for like, you know, because we work with a lot of businesses. So do you like come in and train all the staff? Is there a train the trainer program, anything like that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think at as a, a standard guide, the book itself does provide a pretty good foundation to begin. However, I do offer um, one-to-one -one training and, and workshops. We have a CEU certification actually an Emergent Learning Academy where uh, we go deep dive into Canvas and how it can be applied, assessed, all of the different challenges and questions that would come up from the book. But yeah, it, it, it depends on that clinician's goals. If they were to say probably wanted to utilize this as their primary form of treatment, um, they might want to consider getting more competency in the area of RFT and ACT, because this is very largely based on those frameworks. 
and it would help them in terms of navigating more individualization for that child, customizing the programs, even to um, how they would apply the lesson. Because honestly, I mean, in the book, I have some standard guides on how they could individualize it, how they could create their own art lesson um, after that. I've made sure that there was enough that they could probably cover this an entire a year or two. They'd have something, but I've tried to teach them how to fish too. So um, yeah, I, I think I think it would be helpful if they made sure they had at least a, a standard foundational understanding of RFT and ACT to utilize it. And I, I'm just ignorant here. So RFT, what is that? I know what ACT is, but... Yeah, so relational frame theory, which is, yes. And then would, uh, like... I, I assume that this may be more difficult, and again, I could be wrong, but to collect data on it for, like, for insurance mostly, do you find it? Well, I was going to say, like, have you been able to, to navigate that insurance? and get those um, those goals approved by a funder? Just your experience on that? Yeah, um, I think, and that's something I touch on too in the book is is you can create goals that are aligned with the provider's guidelines without it being, you know, you're probably not going to write a treatment goal that states like art explanations or anything like that. Um, but you're, the, the program is built in a way where you are targeting specific goals for their behaviors or skills you're trying to work on. Starting or running an ABA practice Feeling overwhelmed with where to begin or how to grow up? You're in the right place. At 3 Pies Grad, we cur we've curated a comprehensive suite of consulting services designed to tackle every aspect of your ABA practice. Struggling with rate negotiation or that Optum audit? Worried about compliance or how to set up your core values? We've got you covered. We can also guide you through the essentials of running a smooth operation, effective hiring, staff training, and beyond. But that's not all. Our consulting services are tailor-made for ABA practices like yours, focusing on sustainability, ethical practices, and quality care. Join the hundreds of ABA business owners who have transformed their practice with 3 Pi Squared. It's time to turn your challenges into opportunities. Ready to elevate your ABA practice? Visit us at 3Pi Squared and let's get started. Because together we can achieve more. 3Pi Squared, empowering your ABA practice to succeed. So, I, um, you know, what, what do you do? And is this something that's in the book that kind of helps providers navigate uh, how to like write the treatment plan goal so they get approved by the funder or how to collect the data, you know, especially on the RBT side, like anything with that? Or, or do you, again, suggest that they come to your CEU event for that? Yeah. Um, in the book, I show them how to navigate that area. I think it's really important to understand how to rate treatment goals that will be approved by insurance. And I know that was a challenge for me when I utilized PEAK, um, Dr. Mark Dixon's program um, in relational frame, frame theory-based um, skill treatment. It's just a matter of making sure that your goals are demonstrating how you're remedi remediating the symptoms of autism, essentially. Um, that's what the insurance is looking for. Um, so for example, if to say I was going to work with a kid on um, painting a picture of his favorite things. That's just the theme of the program. I wouldn't write the treatment goal. Um, child will paint a picture of his favorite things. It'll be more like, what are we targeting in that project? Are we targeting him tacting his personal interests? Are we targeting him um, tacting different colors or different media? Are we targeting fine motor skills? So there's actually a lot of functional skill building happening within just that one project that we could be targeting. And a lot of the programming in Canvas is, is going to look that way. It's just a matter of your how you're approaching or how you're writing your treatment goals. 
um, is a very data heavy. I have a lot of data collection systems in place where it helps you really identify more of those subjective areas that are tough because um, in Canvas, I have this, um, this thing called cre creative expansion. Um, this is where you are figuring out where that child is in the area of creative expansion, how they are deriving relations, creating ideas, um, how original or unique those ideas get. And it goes on to like, how are they able to interact with others, connect with others, create and communicate meaningful messages and, and all of those things. Um, I have a process on how to assess for that, how to track the development of that area. Um, and I have processes in place for us to make sure that the clinicians are implementing it flexibly and implementing it accurately. They're taking data accurately. So data is really important in this for sure. Um, it's just understanding how we're approaching it that way. It's, it's very unique in that we don't have this art therapy branch and behavior analysis. And it's kind of funny that we're probably one of the only clinicians in the field of therapy that isn't considered um, someone who could go into art therapy. So we're approaching the art as the tool. We're approaching it as the modality for applied behavior analysis and not it being the therapy itself. I don't know how to explain that, but it's it's not the same as like psychoanalytic therapy. Um, we're, we're approaching behavior, we're approaching verbal behavior in this program. Okay. Yeah, no, it's very clear how you said it, you know, yeah. because it's like the, the tool, the modality, like it's, you're, you're providing the services through the art, you yeah. know, uh, and, and art is there. And, um, but I, I, that was one of the questions that I anticipated our listeners asking, you know, I was like, oh, this sounds really, really fun, really amazing, really, you know, I'd love to, to learn more about this, but can I still bill insurance? Right. Uh, what's the data look like for this? How do I, you know, how do I transition and things like that? Yeah. So that was a really good question. And then I have one more for you. So the medium uh, on what they are, are doing the art on, have you found like, is it better to do it on the iPad with a pen or do you get the, the paint out uh, on a paper or something like that? Do you find one is better than the other or is it just you meet the kid where they're at and, and kind of go from there? Yeah, honestly, it's like a, a meet the kid where you're at versus what resources do you have access to? What resources does the family have access to? I think a lot of those factors are going to, a lot of those things are be factored in. Um, with that said, they could do the entire program digitally. They could do the entire program with pencil and paper. It's just, it's up to like, the clinician and the family and how they want to approach it what that child too you might consider their preferences as well because you'll probably do a preference assessment whereas we figure out like what that kid's more inclined to interact with or what they prefer to engage with and if you're finding that there's some media that that child is absolutely loving like they want to just color in chalk pastels or <laughs> watercolor you might want to utilize that um that motivation for the watercolor to just complete your sessions that way with that media. Um, it's not necessarily, um, it's not art class where like you're actually intentionally trying to teach them the different mediums and get them to use it. We're just going to work with what that, yeah, we're going to work with what that child wants. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I can imagine too, like if you're bringing something like this into in-home therapy, um, some, uh, no pain. <laughs> some parents may be like, mess, don't make a mess, yes, you yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, is there anything that you want to be sure to cover um, that maybe we haven't asked yet that you, you just want to make sure is covered? Maybe, you know, something important to you about what you have to offer and Canvas and all of that. Yeah, sure. I actually, I just published the, the next book that's ACT-based, um, and that's for older, older individuals, so adolescents and adults. That just came out, um, and that utilizes an ACT framework with art as the, the, the tool as well. Um, and then, of course, I, I offer consultation and CEU trainings on the site Canvas ABA in, in the areas of subject matter of art and behavior analysis. 
Oh, that's exciting. I, I need to get some CAUs. <laughs> <laughs> I am coming up in the next few months on, um, you know, my research. So I've been looking for CAUs. So I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, did you have any other questions, Stephen? Not off the top of my head, no. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm so excited about this opportunity to learn more. Um, you know, like in this whole, I'm trying to think how to word this question. Um, in this whole new wave of anti-ABA and, you know, new ABA versus old ABA. And, you know, where I find myself, well, I've always found myself as in, you know, providing services to meet the kid where they're at, you know, compassionate services, whole child, like, type of thing. And so for me, this just makes so much sense because it really lines with my values and how I like to provide services for, for kids, you know, and, or for individuals. Um, so I don't know, like, where, where do you stand or how, you know what, do you know what I'm trying to ask? It's like, uh, you know, like, like what's my in philosophical the, approach? Or? Yeah, like in the, in the field, like in this, like, um, you know, dicey, like, oh, ABA is bad. Like if a parent were to come to you and say, okay, well, maybe, maybe I'm willing to try this form of ABA, right? Because it sounds a little bit different, you know, like what, like how would you respond to that? That's a great question. Like at, as a parent of two, my two boys are on the autism spectrum. And so I do come with that background where I understand the parent and where they're at. And those conversations were definitely part of my own, my own inner conversations when I got into ABA. I was, I was seeing a lot of things that I didn't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily a fan. Like there are a lot of things that as a parent of an autistic child, you learn, you learn how they're communicating. Um, and I come from an aspect of total communication. I love the idea that we will utilize whatever they can to communicate and teach um, albeit like we're still going to try to, to show them other ways that they can communicate in a way that other people can understand them. But like in general, I've always ascribed to the, the philosophy and framework of like naturalistic developmental behavior intervention. So NDBI or play-based ABA. Um, I've always been a fan of that. And I love that we are moving more towards that ascent based teaching model. I'm a big Hanley fan. So everything I've ever done has been, skills-based treatment and um, more uh, like client-centered, like having them a part of the process and them showing you what they need to learn and, and then making sure that they're a part of it is huge. I've had a lot of like client families who've, who've told me right off the bat, hey, I, I want you to please, if my child shows any signs of distress or frustration, I want you to accommodate that. And I understand where they're coming from with that. I'm all about ascent based teaching. So what I, I've done with canvas and the way that I've modeled the programming is that we do work with those kids, we create those accommodations that they need to thrive, that we are providing therapy in a way that we are still going to meet those outcomes that we need, but not in such a way that is so rigid. And um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not rigid or um, straight DTT based kind of a model where we're all very about much about natural, naturally occurring, um, therapy, utilizing what we're doing in the moment and following that child's lead essentially. So, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. It sounds like right up my alley. I'm very excited about learning more. Um, all right. Well, did you have anything else come up? Have you, have you, uh, are, or are you doing this in schools? Uh, have you brought this model to schools? I haven't yet. I know a lot of schools that are utilizing it right now. I would love to help teach other schools to do it, but I, I get a lot of, um, like photos and, and videos from people who are utilizing it in the school and in the clinic at a, at a large scale. And, um, one particular behavior analyst actually brought it to the community which was really exciting to see and had just a phenomenal, like the social validity data from that was like really phenomenal to hear and see that um, parents were, were 
just proclaiming how much their child was loving it, which I think is such a huge and important part of this. Like your child loves therapy and like they're seeing them thrive and they're seeing them with skills they didn't like think they could engage in before, like the way that they're expressing themselves and communicating and like they're seeing, it's almost like a behavioral cusp to these other things that they weren't expecting them to be able to do as a result of doing something that was just so fun for them. So um, yeah, <laughs> I would love to see more of that in schools. Yeah. How exciting. Is there, have you, have you found a spot where like, it's like, yeah, it just doesn't work in this area, right? Like it is, is, do you see that at all or is it just pretty flexible? Yeah. I mean, it depends. I, I made it in such a way that it should be extremely flexible. You could even utilize it where you are just, if you had like a really early learner, right, and you're going through this experiential process with the art, you could just be playing in the paint all day. Um, but there are clients where it might not be feasible, and I've seen it not work with kids that just found it super aversive. Again, it could be something that you, you could work on a desensitization process possibly, or like reintroduce it in smaller increments to see if they build that interest. I've had a client where I've had success doing that, where she was not she actually would engage in a lot of challenging behavior when she encountered having to hold a pencil. And now she's like asking for watercolor and playing with that. So just figuring out what it is that they, there might be something else that they liked and they're finding other things, just certain things aversive. It depends. But I wouldn't force a child to engage in it if they found it incredibly uncomfortable or uninteresting at all. So it's probably going to be the best for those who show it a, even a little interest in art. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just thinking back to like my early intervention years and, you know, there you would think, oh, all kids love art, but there are some who may not like it at first or may not like the traditional way that it's introduced and may take a little while to get them there. Yeah. Or maybe they just never like it. <laughs> I don't know. And how is because you know we do work with some people that are working with adults, and so I, I well, love this idea. Book, yeah. yeah, I love this idea that you're you're doing that. And like, how how much different? Like, is it is it a completely different approach, or is it basically the same thing? Or uh, you know, um, it's more it's pretty much a completely different approach because this is a the new one is prime completely an act framework based model, whereas Canvas itself is um, just standard skill building ABA with art. Um, the, the new one is completely a complete act framework. It's geared towards a form of behavior analysis that I think we haven't really paved a path for. It'll feel like talk therapy. Um, it's definitely for older, more advanced verbal repertoire community, um, people who can um, have discussion and all that. So it's, it's, pretty different from the first one okay. and then my last question is a social skills group have, have you implemented this in a social skills or is that part of canvas itself yes and there's actually um a guide on how to approach it that way as well in the book mm -hmm. that's awesome. awesome so do you have to be an artist <laughs> no, no. And I, t I talk about that too in the book that you do not have to be an artist. And one of the keys for Canvas being successful, honestly, and this is going to be the toughest thing, is for the clinician themselves to be flexible. So realizing that in art, there are absolutely no rules at all. You don't have to draw something a certain way. We're not getting into skills, art skills here. We're not teaching um, people how to figure draw or anything like that. So the clinician has to come to the understanding just, uh, and it's in there too. I give um, basic art 101 in the book. <laughs> so if you've had absolutely no background in art, it will show them just things they need to know, like the effects of certain media and what, what certain techniques might mean if they happen to use it, but absolutely don't have to be an artist to utilize canvas. That's great. I love that you bring up flexibility of the clinician too, because you know, like there again, being like mostly an early intervention, I've been in classrooms where preschool teachers taught that things have to be certain colors and sizes and shapes. And you know, that was always one of my biggest pet peeves of like, if they want purple skin, they can have purple skin. But, um, it, but I think that's so cool because 
you know, it also helps us to learn as clinicians, right? It helps us to learn how to be more present and mindful and, you know, how to regulate our nervous systems as we're able to stay flexible and, like, present this, you know, this um, this therapy too. Yeah, I mean, even as I'm thinking about this, like, and we're, we're like, are we going to take data on if they draw a caterpillar, right? Like, or, or the, like, you know, like, uh, how many... Uh, Pieces legs. of yeah, yes, how segments. many legs? Yes, how many segments? <laughs> of that is like ah, don't get into that. I hope uh, so. Uh, yeah, that, right. that, <laughs> that that would be terrible. I think that would kind of ruin our. I, I would think it sounds uh, like we both had some pretty like structured art yes, experiences yes. in our life. <laughs> I guess so. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I was just looking at my sheet here. So for a business, if they wanted to reach out to you and start this, would you recommend like one BCBA take this on? And and I, I know that you mentioned like you have the CEUs. Um, would, would they then take that and then train the rest of their staff? Like what do you recommend in a situation like that where they just want to bring it across the board? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Honestly, I, I would always recommend that at least one person try to make themselves kind of the expert and then from there help model and, and teach the process to other clinicians. There's some systems in the book too, where it helps a supervisor actually um, make sure they are, their, their supervisees are implementing it correctly. So there's a system for that in the book too. Okay. And if, is there something, like, is there any prerequisites? I know you said you don't have to be a, an art uh, a specialist, or, but it, are there, like, should they, should they have an understanding of ACT or, you know, like, is that, would that well, help? that's what, like, the relational friend okay. theory and ACT, I believe you had said earlier, it's best that you, if you have okay. an understanding so of you that. Okay, so you, you should have an understanding of that, is that correct? Okay. Yeah, definitely, because you're going to be implementing a lot of those concepts with your older learners through the programs. So you really need to understand ACT, be able to understand how you're applying the process, how, like what kind of questions or prompts are going to be coming up from the clinician, how you should approach it, because it's very conversational and there's a very specific, there's a very specific verbal behavior going on that they need to understand that, that a whole approach, because it's completely outside any approach they've ever done is definitely different. And they need to have some kind of standard understanding and maybe even some supervision in that area too. Um, if they're getting into that with the older learners, of course, the, the rest of the program is made in such a way they didn't need to have that, but it'd be helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is that something that you offer? Do you offer any supervision or is it mainly just like um, consulting type work? Or? Um, I do offer supervision um, and I offer mentorship as well for people if clinicians need some support with that. I'm actually working with a few right now where we would do that. Okay. Oh, great. That's awesome. Well, where can everyone find you? Yeah, you can go to canvasaba.com or I am canvas underscore ABA on Instagram. And I'm also known as the artist Natasha on Instagram and TikTok. So <laughs> awesome. Well, um, I guess to end today, when I was looking at your website and um, kind of learning more about you, um, this really stood out to me um, that on your website, it says that you believe in the power of joy and creativity to make positive, socially significant change in people's lives. And I just think that's beautiful. And I'm so glad that there are people like you out in our world today. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. And um, we will put up your links. Mm -hmm. And um, we're excited about, um, you know, meeting up with you again another day. Yeah, it was very cool. Definitely. I I listen to your podcast. So (laughs) I'm very, I'm very, I feel very privileged to be a part of it. So great. Thank you. All All right. Well, I think that's yeah, I had, another, you I, I had another question and I can't remember what oh, it was okay. anymore. Give me a minute. Just going back to the prerequisites, do you feel that there would be any, because like, one of the things in our business leaders membership is childhood development and, you know, like understanding what a two-year-old will bring versus a six-year-old. Do, do you think that that would be, 
that should be something that they should also get the training in uh, as far as like what to expect uh, when you start doing this art program or does that, does that even matter? Like right? developmental like, appropriateness. Yeah. Like does it, stages? does it even matter uh, in this? Yeah, I, I think so. Like even from just the field as a whole, I'm like blown away that we don't have more of developmental under like de child development training. And I think that would be a good, a good um, clinical approach is making sure you have some foundational understanding of that, especially of the NDBI, uh, naturalistic developmental behavior intervention, um, because that's going to give you the perfect foundation for a running canvas. Like that's play based. You're you're learning how to work with those child and their and their developmental goals where they're at developmentally, because you're going to approach it so differently than you would with the older learners. So, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a good question. All right. Yeah, that was it for me. I'm surprised I didn't ask a developmental question because that's normally <laughs> you got it for me. You there had you it go. covered. Well, All thank right. you guys really so much for for coming today. And um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm definitely going to be reaching out to you as I learn more. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Well, awesome. thank you. Thank you. And we'll thank talk you. To you soon. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye.